Good morning. It's Pastor Trish, and uh, thank you for joining me. I'm a little bit late this week because uh, I and the other staff here at Messiah rested on Easter Monday. Um, it was good to be with many of you on Easter Sunday, and we are now looking ahead to the second Sunday of Easter. We get to stay in the Easter season here for a while and continue to celebrate the resurrection. And so our gospel reading for this coming Sunday is a reading that we hear every year on the second Sunday of Easter. It will be a familiar one to you. And I'm going to read it from the 20th chapter of John. And I invite you to see if you remember how we often refer to this reading. I bet it will come to you quickly. John chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw his, when they saw his, excuse me, when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my finger in the mark of his nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Uh, this passage has so much in it. It's hard to know where to begin or for a preacher, it's hard to know what to focus on. This coming Sunday, one of the things we will be doing in our worship services here at Messiah is celebrating with our eighth graders their affirmation of baptism. And so um, I definitely am keeping those young folks in mind. And um, I've told told them all during class the last few years and uh, a, a couple of them on an independent basis as well when I when we've done our kind of final time together in interviews if there's one thing I you know I actually I hope there's a couple of things they've learned over the last few years certainly the one uh, thing is that they are loved with an incredible and everlasting and steadfast faithful love from God and nothing will ever take that away and that they uh, are with God is with them um, every moment of their lives but the other thing that I hope they've learned it just almost as important I would say is that it's okay to wonder and to question and in this case, the story that we often think of as doubting Thomas, to have some doubts and that they are perfectly fine. And so I recognize that I uh, will want to likely go that direction once more with um, those eighth graders as part of my captive audience on Sunday morning. But there's so much more in this reading in addition to that. When it comes to that particular piece itself in terms of Thomas doubting even as I was reading it again now I was like wait a minute the first time Jesus showed up when Thomas wasn't there he automatically showed the other disciples his hands in his side we make such a big deal out of Thomas having to see the marks in his hands in his side well he automatically showed it to the other disciples so they didn't even have to ask so is that that big a deal 
And then the other thing I think about is those other disciples rejoiced. I believe another translation translation says they were amazed when they saw their Lord. So I was wondering, why does the gospel writer here, why does John focus on Thomas and not the other 11 and their responses? What what was necessary that we spent all of this time on Thomas, who didn't get to see Jesus the first time he stopped in and had to wait for the second time? And so what's that about in terms of his particular reaction? And was it really that different than the other 11? Or was it just an opportunity for um, telling the story in a, maybe a better way? Keep in mind that uh, the writer goes on right after this to say Jesus did many other signs that are not written, but these are written down so that you may believe, so that you and I can believe. And so is that why this is an emphasis on this story? And why is it that the church, the the church at large, um, many of us share what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. So we share common scripture readings every Sunday, whether we're Lutheran or Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian. And uh, why is it that the folks who put that lectionary together many years ago include this particular reading every single Sunday after Easter, no matter what year we are in. For example, this is year C in our lectionary, and we're often in the Gospel of Luke, and there are some great resurrection, great resurrection stories in the Gospel of Luke. But instead, we're turning to John and to this story of Thomas today. What's that about? Many will say that calling him a doubting Thomas was perhaps is is perhaps not as accurate as it could be. I was in a, a, a kind of an online lectionary study or uh, delving into the word earlier this week, and we were asked to come up with an alternative name that might better reflect what's happening here. And many, many people called uh, Thomas Pragmatic, the Pragmatic Thomas, or Honest Thomas, or Honest the Truth Teller, or uh, Thomas the uh, scientist, one person said, Thomas the truth seeker, even Thomas the vulnerable, being willing to say, I'm not sure. I want to know more and understand more. And then one other thing that I'm thinking about is once Thomas sees uh, the transformation that perhaps it took place in him. As I heard somebody else say, you know, Thomas from this situation goes on and travels to India and starts churches, perhaps even to China. And so this experience transformed him in a way that perhaps no other experience might have. And what is that about? And what does that say about how God works in us and through us and even beyond us? So I think there's all sorts of things to think about. And then I think that's also just one aspect of this story. I love the fact that Jesus says, peace be with you, not once, not twice, but three different times in just this small passage in this particular pericope. First words he says, peace, peace be with you. He also offers the Holy Spirit. And if you remember, if you are a John scholar or reader at all, you'll know that prior to the crucifixion, we had several chapters there, believe beginning in chapter 14, where we have what we often call the farewell discourse. And Jesus leaves, it's like he dumps on his disciples everything he wants them to remember, knowing he'll be gone soon. And the Holy Spirit and the advocate who will come, he says, I have to leave so the advocate can come. And so that's a big thing that Jesus talks about in John. And here he is right away. He says, I give you peace. I give you peace. And I also give you the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. How do we interpret that and what does that mean? And finally, one more thing for you to chew on is that next verse where he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why is that in here? 
And what exactly is he talking about? Is this a part of the sending that will soon happen as they go out now and spread the word and draw people into the good news and go out and preach and baptize and begin new communities of faith? And is that how forgiveness of sins plays into that? Is he giving them uh, responsibility? I would prefer responsibility over power in terms of um, speaking on behalf to to remind people of the importance of forgiveness of sins and the gift that God has given us in that opportunity. So again, lots of things to think about with that. I could probably go on and on, but I don't want to keep you all day. I've been yakking at you enough. So I uh, hope you'll join us on Sunday as we delve into this a little bit more. And I hope you take opportunity as well to spend a few minutes more rereading this particular passage, finding out what questions it brings up in you. What do you hear? What sticks out to you? And what might that mean for your life in Christ, for your faith in the one that we know and call our Lord and God? Have a great day and we'll see you soon.